So I hope this is not overly philosophical for an after lunch <laughs> presentation, but I'll do my best to, to keep it lively. And I hope, um, particularly with this crowd, this presentation will be an opportunity to think in a sense more deeply about some of the underlying philosophical reasons for the very insights that we've seen this morning. And it's gonna focus mostly on some of the philosophical reasons underlying the problems with uh, third party um, reproduction, but is also gonna touch kind of via the back door on the same sex marriage issue. So to kind of start out, and, I, and I, the presentation roughly follows the handout which hopefully is helpful since um, at times it can get a little abstract, but again, I'm gonna try to, to, keep it, to keep it moving. So I begin just with some empirical observations about the facts on the ground that many children uh, like uh, Alana, who we'd heard from this morning, who were conceived with the help of donor sperm or eggs, they've now reached adulthood and studies are showing that many of these donor conceived adults seek to know about and have some contact with their donor parent. And these studies together with lobbying efforts spearheaded by donor conceived persons who claim a right to know their biological parents have led to regulations outlawing anonymous gamete donation in Sweden, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, the UK, and several Australian states. While anonymous gamete donation remains legal throughout the US, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine did officially endorse non-anonymous donation, or non-anonymous, um, yeah, non-anonymous donation in 2002. And a recent study indicates that actually an overwhelming majority of prospective parents seeking to conceive with the help of donor gametes now prefer donors who are willing to release their identity. So this shift away from the use of anonymous gamete donors is of course a good thing, and it parallels the shift uh, in adoption practices toward greater openness in adoption. Both of these things mark an increasing recognition on the part of society that knowledge of one's biological origins and contact with one's biological parents, being raised by them when possible, are very important for human well-being. Now this recognition and the resulting move away from anonymous gamete donation points to a more fundamental critique of donor conception. In fact, if you look at them, the basic arguments against anonymous gamete donation, the recognition that children have a fundamental interest in knowing and if possible being raised by their biological parents, this implies that conceiving children with donor gametes is always morally problematic even when the donor is not anonymous because it always involves conceiving children with the intention of depriving them of a parental relationship with one of their progenitors. So it's different from the usual case of adoption in which a child already exists and putting that child up for adoption is judged as the way to give that child the best possible care in admittedly non-ideal circumstances. So while it seems hard to deny that at least for medical purposes and perhaps also for the purposes of better understanding their own identity, children can benefit from access to information about their biological parents. A lot of people still remain skeptical of the claim that actually being raised by biological parents is important for the well-being of children. After all, many adopted and donor-conceived persons do flourish in life and many raised by their biological parents fare quite poorly. And although studies have found that, by and large, children tend to do best overall when raised by their married biological parents, that's the kind of sociological gold standard for child well-being, still, some argue, well, this is maybe simply due to cultural attitudes, the heteronormativity we heard about before, and, uh, and it's the result just of those cultural attitudes that place emphasis on biological ties, and that's why these children in other situations are doing worse. So an accurate ethical evaluation of donor conception requires a deeper philosophical investigation. It can't just rely on the empirics as valuable as those studies are. So what we need to ask really is the following question. Are there actually unique benefits to children in being raised by their biological parents or is, biological, is a biological parent in principle fully interchangeable with any other equally competent and loving parental figure? Now obviously you're probably gonna guess what my answer to that question is gonna be and you have it on the handout too, but I'm gonna argue uh, 
unsurprisingly, that the parent-child biological bond really does matter in itself. And the reason for that, sort of picked out philosophically, is that there's at least one unique and important benefit that biological parents and only biological parents can provide for their children, and that benefit is the benefit of their parental love. Um, you know, that might seem kind of like a cheap answer, but actually it's quite important. So my claim is that children have a fundamental interest in being loved, not just by any caregiver, but by their own biological parents, and that strictly speaking, no one else can replace biological parents in this regard. And so in, except in cases of genuine incompetence, biological parents can't love their children as they ought to, as they have an obligation to and as their children need them to, without raising those children themselves. Of course, when biological parents can't or won't raise their children themselves, others can generously take on that task and they can do an overall excellent job. And in doing so, they can and usually do show great love for those children. But their love can't replace the absent love of the child's biological parents, no more than the love of another man or woman can replace the love of an absent or deceased spouse. Right? It's valuable, but it's, it's different. You can't replace people in that way. And so the reason why biological parents' love is irreplaceable to their children is that biological parents, simply by virtue of their biological, and by biological here I mean genetic, connection to their children, that that genetic connection in itself is an intimate and personal relationship to those children. The absence of their love is therefore not like the absence of a stranger's love, because even if the child and the biological parents have never met, biological parents are not strangers to their children. Or are they? Right, so for those who view the person as essentially a kind of bundle of interconnected psychological states, which is the dominant view in philosophy now, a merely genetic parent, of which a gamete donor is kind of the paradigm example, is a stranger to the biological child because donor and child have had no conscious interactions with each other. If, on the other hand, human beings are essentially, as I believe, animal organisms, rational animal organisms, but animal organisms nonetheless, then gamete donors are not strangers to their children because donor and child have an intimate and enduring connection to each other at the organic or bodily level. So one's understanding of the ethics of donor conception ultimately turns on one's view of the human person. And so only if you understand the human being as a rational animal, a unity of body, soul, and spirit in the Aristotelian Thomistic sense, can you make sense of the claim that biological ties matter and that children have an interest in being raised by their biological parents that isn't just the result of prevailing social customs and conventions? So in what follows, what I'm going to do is provide a very brief defense and explanation of the claim that human beings are a unity of body and spirit and then provide further explanation of the connection between that metaphysical claim and the moral claim that children have a fundamental interest in being raised by their biological parents. And then in the final section, I'll kind of bring these ideas together to conclude that donor conception is always an injustice because it intentionally deprives a child of the important right to be loved by his or her biological parents. And so the, my focus here is mostly on the ways in which donor conception involves an injustice to children I will also offer a few related reflections about how donor conception involves serious harm to marriage and family more generally, and how it falsely sends the message that same-sex couples are the equivalent of opposite-sex couples with regard to their potential for childbearing and childrearing. So the case of artificial reproduction that doesn't involve the use of a third-party um, donor is also, I think, unjust to the child and harmful to the marriage for similar reasons, um, but I'm only going to kind of leave that at the, at the fringes and focus here on, um, on donor conception cases. So first section here, very briefly, the metaphysical claim that human beings are a unity of body and soul. Human beings are rational animals. And as I mentioned, the dominant view in philosophy on 
personal identity is what's called the psychological view. You know, you are, you know, the I or the self is determined exclusively by psychological features, your consciousness, your memory, your desires, your thinking, your choosing, and the continuity of your identity over time is just a, a function of your psychological continuity. A different view, which is also sort of out there, uh, though less prominent, is called animalism, which hold that, holds that human beings are essentially living animals. The most prominent version is defended by Eric Olson, and his version, as I understand it, is too reductive. It reduces human identity to animal identity with sort of nothing more. So the account um, that I defend here differs from both. So unlike the psychological view in any of its variants, I think that we're essentially bodily persons, right? Not just a functioning higher brain or some other form of non-conscious, non-bodily conscious self that inhabits and uses a non-personal body as an extrinsic instrument. And while I agree with Olson that biological identity is essential and intrinsic to personal identity, and I also consider a continued existence of the human organism as a necessary and sufficient condition for continuity of personal identity, my view is different from his in that I do not think that personal identity can be reduced to biological identity. So, you know, what we're talking about here is basically, um, as I said, um, Aristotelian to mystic hylomorphism. And the, the crucial thing for this account and for understanding the moral relevance of genetic parenthood is to understand that the human soul is the formal principle of all of a human being's operations, everything from homeostasis and digestion to deliberation and conceptual thought. The soul that is the form of the human body, making the body be a human body, that's the formal principle of biological identity and integrated organic functioning, is the same soul that is the principle of the human person's rational capacities. It is the soul that makes the body be and be what it is. There's no living body without a soul, no human body without a human soul. And the human soul is the formal principle of all the acts and operations of the whole unified psychophysical substance that is the human person. So continuity of biological identity, that is continued existence of the same human organism, is a necessary and sufficient condition for continuity of personal identity over time. And our identity as human organisms is an essential and intrinsic aspect of our overall personal identity. This isn't because biological identity exhausts personal identity, but because a human organism's existence and continued existence over time shows the corresponding presence of the soul as the organism's formal principle of integrated functioning. And that in turn shows the presence of the entire soul as the formal principle of all of a human being's acts and operations, including uh, conceptual thought, uh, free choice, and so on. So for brevity's sake, I'm going to skip over the kind of argument for this view, except to note as a kind of helpful dialectical point for those who uh, tend toward the psychological view, which which is the dominant view, not just in philosophy, but in the culture, right? People won't go out there and say, oh, I'm a, I'm a believer in the psychological view of identity. But in the way that people live, they live as if their bodies were as extrinsic instruments to, um, to who they are. I mean, that kind of makes sense of the misunderstanding of marriage and everything else is, well, yeah, what, whatever my, there is no such thing as an actual language of my body. It's whatever I want my body to express is what it's expressing. Right? So what's actually going on physiologically has nothing to do with it. Right? So they, they, they don't understand uh, why sexual acts um, of the type that are possible between two men and two women are not the equivalent of sexual acts of a reproductive type between a man and a woman because they think that the biology is just um, like totally extrinsic to you. It has nothing to do with your personal reality. So this, the area of reproductive technologies is another one where this kind of dualism is, is seen. And so as a, as a kind of dialectical point that has, is sometimes helpful for getting people to realize the absurdity uh, of that dualist po- position is to note that unless you recognize that a human organism is a human person, that our bodies are personal, um, you can't explain, for instance, why rape is a personal violation, not just a violation of property. Even if the victim is unconscious, never learns about it, and is not harmed physically, because there's no harm to the conscious self. So if I am not my body, 
then you can't explain why you've done anything wrong to me by raping me when I'm unconscious if I never find out. So that, that argument can hold some dialectical punch with people because if, there, if there's one thing that anybody still agrees is wrong universally, it's rape. <laughs> you, you, you can't get people to think there's a universal right and wrong using killing of the innocent. That doesn't work anymore. Almost anything else, people will say, ah, but rape, you can, especially if you're a woman talking to a man, you could never get them to say, oh, no, in some instances, that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you could milk that for all it's worth. Okay, so... Um, so now, having explained and defended the, the view, well, not really defended, but anyway, it's a sympathetic audience. I probably don't need to defend it here. But anyway, having explained the view that the, of the human person as a body-soul unity that underlies uh, the ethical claims I'm going to make, I'm now going to explain how this implies that the biological parent-child relationship is itself a personal relationship that makes the child uniquely dependent on each of her biological parents for the ideal fulfillment of her developmental needs, particularly the very basic need to be loved by her biological parents. I'll argue further that the, personal, that the existence of this personal relationship is what grounds the special and non-transferable obligations that biological parents have to their children, obligations that are, that are correlates of children's right to be loved by their their biological parents. So I, I kind of switch the language from the language of right to the language of obligation back and forth, just depending on the perspective. Parents have the obligation, and children's, children as the beneficiary of that obligation uh, could be said to have the right to receive their love. So in, in claiming that the parent-child relationship is a personal one, I assume that a relationship, just broadly understood, is a union or interconnection of persons with respect to one or more dimensions of their being, uh, intellectual, volitional, affective, bodily, and that a specifically personal relationship in the strict sense of the term is one in which that connection between persons is based at least in part on some unique identifying characteristics of each person. So my relationship with a close friend is personal because it's based on on particular identifying characteristics of, of her that are not replaceable by anybody else, whereas you know, the relationship with the, the cashier at CVS is not, right? The, the, uh, and any, any other cashier who's equally competent, even now the automa automated checkout machines can sort of do just as well for me, whereas when I want to have lunch with a particular friend, uh, somebody else can't just show up in that person's place. It's not the same. So. When you think of personal relationship, think of sort of irreplaceability, right, based on, because there are unique characteristics involved. So, you know, if, for instance, your husband dies, uh, one, you know, you might choose to remarry, but nobody else can replace the husband that died. So those in a personal relationship are irreplaceable to one another because being in a personal relationship implies that there are things that person and only that person can do for you in the broadest sense of the word. In other words, if you're in a personal relationship with someone, that means there are some benefits that you and only you can give to that person and vice versa. So these benefits, just for the sake of having a name for them, you could call them personal benefits. So a, a kind of paradigmatic example of a personal benefit is precisely the specific love of the particular person with whom you have a personal relationship. Right? That is not... Um, Replaceable. Just to avoid confusion here, sometimes when you use the word love, probably not so much in this crowd, but in general, people think of just something purely emotional, right? So, of course, I recognize that love in its fullest sense uh, involves an affective component, but here when I talk about an obligation to love or a right to receive love, I'm, I'm talking about love primarily as a commitment of the will uh, to the good of another person, the strength of which will rightfully vary depending on the nature and closeness of the relationship. So a view of love where it's also an ordered love, depending on the degree of closeness that you have to the particular person. So this understanding of relationships is important for recognizing the nature, the scope, and the strength of our obligations towards others, because aside from, and even perhaps more importantly than the voluntary commitments that we take on, it's the nature and closeness of our relationships to others that determine the relative weight and priority of our obligations to them. As Alistair McIntyre points out in Dependent Rational Animals, human beings are not only rational animals, but dependent 
rational animals, whose bodiliness and whose particular mode of exercising rationality as bodily beings implies that we are vulnerable and dependent at all levels. And based on this understanding of human dependence, he argues that human beings naturally form a part of a network of givers and receivers in which what we receive and what we are called upon to give depends not on reciprocity, but really on, on need, and in which um, on need and on capacity, respectively. And we can achieve our fulfillment as human beings only by finding our place within such a network. And that place can be found by determining the nature of our relationships, both chosen and non-chosen, that we have with others. So translating that kind of insight from McIntyre into the language of obligation, what this means is that the needs of others and our specific unique capacity to meet those needs are what fundamentally determine our obligations and that the order of priority among competing obligations to others it depends on the closeness of our relationship to the person in need, as well as the importance of the need in question for the person's overall well-being. Further, when what the person needs is a personal benefit, a benefit that only a specific person can provide, then the obligation to provide that benefit is a non-transferable one. It must be carried out personally. And you know, this is kind of abstract, but if you, if you just kind of think through uh, the way that you order most of your obligations in life, you'll see that this actually pans out uh, quite well. That you recognize that you give priority to the people that are closer to you, and that's not selfish. That's because they rightfully um, have more of a claim on you, because there are things that you can do for the people closer to you that you can't do for strangers because of the relationship that you have. They need you more than strangers do because of the relationship that you have, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, as a kind of general theory, it really just makes sense of how we, how we live. Now in a weak sense, everyone has a relationship, and perhaps even a personal relationship, depending on your interpretation, with every other human being, at least at the bodily level, because we all share, you know, if you go all the way back, right, a common genetic origin and inheritance. I mean, they've even traced the mitochondria, I believe, all the way back to one particular woman in, in Africa for the whole human race. So we all go back, right, to some common uh, genetic origin, some common cause. Uh, further, the love of any particular person is always irreplaceable in the strict sense to every other person. Um, does that, you know, does this account imply that every person has a non-transferable obligation to love every other person? Yes, and probably most people in this room have no problem with that claim, right? But, um, but that what that simply means is that every person has a sort of prima facie obligation to be a help and not a hindrance to the well-being of, of every other human person. Obviously, though, the well-being of some will rightfully take priority over that of of others uh, in accordance with the closeness of one's relationships and the importance of the benefit that you can provide. So the earlier conclusion um, that a child has a relationship to um, his or her biological parents is, is relevant here because you see not only do they have a relationship, but when you look at, well, how close is that relationship? You realize that from the perspective of the child, that is clearly and by far the closest of their human relationships, right? That for, from the child's perspective, to be born of those specific parents is identity determining. Uh, they, they wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be who you are if you were born from <laughs> any other different parents. Um, so, you know, it de determines that you are and who you are. And at that stage of your life, you, the only, well, not the only, because you do have relationships down the line to your other relatives, right, genetically, but clearly the closest in terms of biological causality and biological origin and identity determination and so on is the, your biological uh, progenitors, your genetic parents. So what that means, if this whole analysis about the level of special obligations depending on closeness of relationships and, and the, the weight of the need and so on, that means that um, since the child's closest human relationship is the biological parents, and since the need of that child is obviously extremely great, uh, that the obligation of biological parents 
to raise their children, which starts not after birth, but of course prior to birth as well. So raising includes gestation. Uh, that it's the biological parents that have the greatest and most direct obligation for the well-being of their children, precisely because they have the closest and most intimate relationship with them. So you can ask, well, why can't biological parents fulfill this obligation just by ensuring that some competent others will raise the child? So some people in favor of gamete donation have raised this question. And you know, when you consider the specific case of, of gamete donors, you might argue that while donors do have some initial obligation to the children that they help to conceive, that obligation maybe could be fulfilled insofar as they have good reason to believe that the, the others who are you know, going to the fertility clinic are eager to raise the child and uh, competent to, to do so. Now, very often, in fact, usually, at least in this country, even that obligation is, is not met since donors usually know nothing at all about the would-be parents who will use their gametes to conceive. And as it's well known, in the US, fertility clinics will offer their services to anybody who can pay for them. So um, there's no guarantee at all that uh, you're going to get good parents <laughs> for your genetic children if you're a gamete donor. So, so even just from that perspective, they're taking their moral obligations too lightly. However, donors, as genetic parents of the child conceived through their donation, can't fulfill their obligations to their children just by ensuring that others will raise the child competently. Even if they, they met that bar, that wouldn't be enough. And the reason is that, except in the case of genuine incompetence, the special and kind of prioritary love that biological parents owe to their children is not compatible with failing to raise those children. The only exception is when there are extremely serious countervailing reasons like genuine incompetence, reasons of the sort that would enable the child herself, once she learns why her biological parents chose not to raise her and is capable of making a mature judgment on the matter, that child could understand that, OK, my biological parents didn't raise me but I understand because it was, they were in this situation of dire poverty or my mom was in this situation where she was 14 years old and her parents weren't supportive and so I'm just grateful that she gave birth to me and, and, and found good parents for me and it was hard for her to give me up but it was because she loved me that she gave me up. Right? If, you, if as an adopted child you can understand the reasons for your adoption in that way, then you realize, okay, my parents did feel, fulfill that specific obligation to love me and in this unique case, they fulfilled it by giving me up because they realized they couldn't give me a decent life themselves. But, but in any other case, a child can't look back and, and have that narrative. So in any other case, there's going to be that wound of, you know, why did they give me up? Did they care at all? That, that wound that comes from recognizing there's no narrative here that makes me able to understand that I was loved and am loved by my biological uh, parent or parents who are who are absent. So only in a case where the child could reasonably look back and understand themselves to be loved by you um, can you fulfill your strictly non-transferable obligation to love your biological children without raising them yourself. And it's also worth noting here that the empirical evidence about adopted children strongly supports the claim that the love of your biological parents is important and irreplaceable and that its absence has a significant negative impact on the overall well-being of children. Researchers have noted that one of the greatest psychological difficulties that adopted children face is that sense of having been rejected or abandoned by their biological parents. There's um, some really um, strong and, and insightful research uh, by James Garbarino, the author of a book called Lost Boys, where he talks about juvenile delinquency as a result of this problem, but one of the things that he mentions there is that often, you know, adults who are adopted can't even bring up this issue without the aid of, of counseling, that they just have this open wound of feeling rejected and abandoned by their biological parents. And this also is one of the advantages to children that's now been found of, of open adoptions rather than totally closed adoptions. It's precisely that in in a more open adoption scenario, this can often allow children to learn that their biological parents did and do love them and gave them up for adoption because of that love, not out of rejection or indifference. So uh, 
a little bit um, more comparison briefly between gamete donation and adoption, I think, can help to give um, plausibility to what I've been saying also. So if you know, think about a couple of cases that we could imagine of, of parents giving up their children for adoption and why we would consider it wrong. So first case, imagine Jane and Joe. Um, Jane gets pregnant. They decide to put up their newborn for adoption because the presence of the baby would make it impossible for them to have their long-awaited romantic vacation in Hawaii. Right? So everybody would, who sees that case would say, oh, well, that's, that's clearly morally wrong because absent a serious countervailing reason, we think the parents have an obligation to raise their own children. But now let's think of a slight variation on that case. Um, so Amanda and, and Arnold. Now, they want a little bit of extra money so that they can afford to go on a romantic vacation in Hawaii next year. And Amanda discovers that if she gets pregnant, she'll be eligible to participate in a study at the local hospital that offers generous compensation, enough to pay for the vacation. So she decides to seize the opportunity. They, the couple takes intentional steps to conceive. You know, they monitor Amanda's cycles and so on and um, make sure they have intercourse on the days when she's fertile. And then their plan is to give the child up for adoption as soon as he or she is born because they just want the money to participate in the study. So they're seeking just to be pregnant, not to be parents. And, uh, you know, and they don't want the baby now. The newborn will keep them from having their romantic vacation. So we, we would usually think that that's even worse than Jane and Joe, right? Because Amanda and Arnold got pregnant on purpose to get the money from the pregnancy with the intention of then later giving up the child. So that is actually coming close to what gamete donors are doing. Now, think of a different example, because some people might say, oh, but, you know, you make the case sort of skewed because the romantic vacation is a very trivial sort of thing. So what about this one? Amanda and Arnold are in desperate need of money. Amanda discovers that if she becomes pregnant, she'll be eligible to participate in a study, kind of same thing as before, but this time they don't want a vacation, they just, want, they just need food for the coming months, and they know that this is going to give them the, the money. So, you know, and they do the same thing. Now, this is also... Um, you know, maybe we judge them a little less harshly than the romantic vacation scenario, but still we would think that's a wrong attitude toward a child, to conceive just for the sake of being able to get money out of being pregnant and then wanting to give the child up for adoption. But you might also say, okay, it's not exactly the same as the gamete donor because they just, Amanda and Arnold, intend to conceive, right? They need to get pregnant for, this, for, the, for them to get the money, whereas the donor just foresees. He never knows whether a child will actually be conceived with his gametes. So then you could tweak the case a little bit more. Amanda and Arnold, same case, desperate need of money. They're going to die of starvation. Amanda learns of a local fertility clinic that's offering compensation for participation in a study on the effectiveness of fertility treatments. And so they decide to participate in the treatment, and they foresee that as a result of participating, they'll end up uh, getting pregnant. And again, they have every intention of giving the child up for adoption if pregnancy should occur. Now that just seems to me to be the exact equivalent of what gamete donors do. Right? Just like Amanda and Arnold, donors perform actions that will foreseeably lead to their becoming biological parents while having no intention of raising those children themselves. So if we think that the actions of a couple like Amanda and Arnold are clearly wrong, or uh, recognize that that's a, a very wrong attitude to have toward a child, just to use instrumentally, uh, for the sake of something else, then uh, we should also think that the actions of gamete donors are wrong and for precisely the same reason, namely that a child has at least a prima facie right to be raised by his or her biological parents based on the absolute right to be loved by biological parents. So by way of conclusion, let me just synthesize here and then point to a couple of further implications very quickly. So. You know, the first claim, a metaphysical claim, human beings are essentially animal organisms. Second claim, um, about our obligations, that our general obligation to promote the well-being of others is specified largely by the nature and closeness of our relationships with others, as well as the importance of the other's need. And I've also argued that there's a non-transferable obligation to provide personal benefits, benefits that only a specific person can provide, of which one example is the love of that specific person. So putting all these metaphysical and the ethical claims together, I stated that the biological parent-child relationship is itself a personal relationship in which the child is personally dependent on his biological parents, and that the most strictly personal benefit that biological parents can give their children is the benefit of their 
parental love. And therefore, biological parents have a strictly non-transferable obligation to love their children themselves, an obligation which is weighty, given the unique closeness of the parent-child biological relationship and the crucial importance of this benefit for the well-being of the child. And then I further argued that in order to love their children adequately, biological parents must raise those children themselves, except in cases of genuine incompetence. So these obligations on the part of parents then correlate to the children's absolute right to be loved by their biological parents and to the strong prima facie right to be raised by biological parents. Now, this line of reasoning provides a principled account of common intuitions about the wrongness of conceiving and or giving up children for adoption for trivial or mercenary reasons, as we saw in the, the string of cases I looked at at the end. Now, gamete donors, by acting in a way that will foreseeably lead to their becoming biological parents, precisely on condition that they won't be called upon to raise the resulting children, therefore act wrongly by failing to show adequate respect for the rights of their future children. It's a wrong that, if you want to get the specifics of it, it's a, it's a wrong that consists in a conditional willingness, conditional because there's no certainty that a child will result, to harm their future children by depriving them of an important benefit to which they have an absolute right, the benefit of being loved by their biological parents. If you want to think of a kind of mundane example, it's kind of like telling somebody, oh yeah, I'll meet you for lunch in the priz at, you know, at 12.30 with absolutely no intention of showing up. And then, you know, maybe it, maybe it happens that the other person has to cancel, you know, so maybe it'll turn out that you didn't, you know, actually do anything wrong. But just to have made the promise with no intention of fulfilling it is already wrong. So you can think of the same with gamete donors. Maybe a child won't result, but just to have initiated that relationship with no intention of following through is, um, is a harm. So obviously if it's wrong for uh, someone to don donate their gametes to con for this purpose, it's wrong also for others to use the donated gametes. Um, both because it's encouraging something that's wrong in itself, but also because it likewise involves a failure to respect the right of the child uh, to be raised um, and loved by his or her own biological parents. And, you know, and then bringing this very briefly to the marriage question, right? Assuming a view of marriage as a comprehensive union of persons at the intellectual, volitional, psychological and, crucially, bodily levels, which is exclusively, uniquely possible through sexual reproductive complementarity and a union that also calls for comprehensiveness over time, permanence, and at any one time, exclusivity or monogamy, conception with donor gametes, even when this is done with the consent of the infertile spouse, is also an injustice to one's spouse and a serious affront to marital unity. In other words, it's kind of like a sex-free version of adultery, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? Monogamy isn't just not having sex with anybody other than your spouse, but it's also not having children with anybody other than your mm -hmm. spouse. So the result then of this non-monogamous childbearing is also the introduction of a fundamental inequality in the marital relationship due to the fact that one parent is biologically connected to the child and the other is not, and as was mentioned before, social science along with experience, you know, the unanimous voice of world literature from Cinderella to Dickens show that this step-parent situation very often constitutes a serious source of tension between spouses and within the family more broadly, usually to the profound detriment of the children. And so the irony here is that what should be the furthering of the marital union, the procreation of a child, that's the manifestation and result of the spouse's two-in-one flesh unity, becomes instead a profound source of disunion and inequality within the marriage. Now, all, everything here also serves to re reinforce the already existing arguments explaining why marriage essentially requires male-female sexual complementarity and uh, why enshrining that vision of marriage in law is important for protecting the well-being of children. So even though it is said that a same-sex couple can have children through ART, that's not really true. And it's not, as in the case of a child conceived in marriage, that the couple has a child. I've got to wrap up, right? Yeah, okay. I, I really am on the last paragraph. But that each individual within the same-sex couple can have a biologically related child of his or her own, which, which is totally different. 
And um, so as we've seen, this is far from ideal for the child because it involves intentional alienation from one of the biological parents and a very odd sort of step-parent scenario with particular risks and abuses, as Alana was, was saying, right, that um, to be in a home, especially with a non-biologically related male, is a huge risk. Um, at least, um, even with lesbians, they found they're 10 times more likely to have been touched sexually by a parent or other adult caregiver if raised in a lesbian household. The, the numbers aren't in on the gay households, but you can imagine that's probably going to be even higher. So, you know, anything that is undermining the gold standard of biological married parents, like treating same-sex couples as the equivalent of opposite-sex couples, is not only going to be a failure to respect the truth about marriage in law, but also a failure to respect the rights of children to be conceived and raised by their own married biological parents. Thanks. <laughs>